institution, especially being that it's the last full session. <laughs> and my counterpart, Rob Duggins, is the last session tomorrow, and you will want to be there. I'm going to put a plug in for him because he has his knowledge management topic. It's it's amazing, um, and he uh, we've done so much at our firm with that. So I just want to make sure that you don't um, nod off by then tomorrow. Either. <laughs> This is Swati Agrawal. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that was much better. The first round was a little, a little sketchy there. Um, so Swati, um, that's my line, and she's a recovery lawyer, um, but she is an Ivy League um, grad lawyer to give her some credibility for the audience today, um, and also the CEO and owner of a very successful um, website company that does um, other types of law or other types of websites as well, but definitely law firm websites. I think, uh, especially for the lawyers in the room, they might not realize that there's 
so much that can be done at the back end of a website now. So it's not just the, the, the visuals of what you see, but you can have experienced databases on the back end, um, automatic proposals that get made with the click of some different buttons on the back end of your website. And so um, I thought it would be interesting in that survey I took, I, I thought you'd like to see how your peers um, ranked in relation to like what you have versus some of these, the most popular features that are out there for the back end of a website. Um, and this is how the results came out. So you see here, um, the vast majority, this is a percentage bar right here, so um, nearly 70% of us all have analytics and metrics reporting on the back end of our website. Uh, that's been out for a little while now, it's super important. I'll share with you a personal story of how I've, I've used the analytics. Is uh, We've been doing digital advertising for our firm for about three years now, and I recently went back and looked at when we started the advertising um, to today, and we realized that steadily we can see the growth of our website visitors, um, and through certain campaigns when they were running hard, you could see a lot more clicks um, onto the website, um, to the point where we now have 20,000 more visitors to our website every quarter um, than we did when we started our ad campaign. So that's just one sample of why analytics and metrics reporting is such a, a valuable tool. Uh, we're, we will go through all these. You'll have the, the slides as Wendy mentioned um, in the app. But responsive design, that also makes sense, right? Because uh, today, everybody has different kinds of, you, know, you have your iPads. You, you can look around this room and see all the different devices everybody has, a laptop, an iPad, an iPhone, uh, Samsung. You need something to be um, responsive, right, for all those different mechanisms automatically so that you're giving the users um, the experience that you want them to have instead of like a, a crazy mess. Um, the other thing I'll point out on this slide is I was actually quite surprised. The experience management database um, didn't have anybody that is currently in this room, at least, um, employing on that end of their website. And that tends to be one of the most popular things. So I'm uh, not sure what to make of it. That's probably a topic for another day. Uh, we don't have it, but it's certainly something we're looking at. We do actually have it in our, um, it, it's built there, yeah. but we don't use it yet. We haven't turned it ah. But it, it, it is there, so I should have said that. All right, we've got one innovator. Oh, sorry. That, that experience management database is when you, um, your lawyers have different pockets of experience, like reverse triangular mergers, let's just say, you know, little specialty things um, that you build in the, in the back end of the website and can kind of tick off or add these different pockets of experience. And that way, when somebody in the firm um, might come to you and say, oh my gosh, we need somebody that can do reverse triangular mergers, you can easily pull that up. Um, it's not public. Uh, it's, it's all on the back end so that you can pull your experience like that. Uh, a lot of it will pull right from the bio as well, but then you can supplement with additional keywords. But that is a debate that we have every year. But should we have that publicly available on our website or not publicly or not? And it's a debate because a lot of our work is private. It's not public right. oriented. So how many times do you want to say active or you have know, some generic description without any details and that's not going to say no. So we, this is the debate we have all the time. Might be a good topic for we do. We have a lot of those same debates, and I bet everybody in this room does. <laughs> Might be a good one for our next meeting. <laughs> um, for RFP and vendor selection, so I thought this was interesting. In that same poll we took, um, you can see here that nearly 50% of the people in this room are contemplating a website um, redesign or refresh, and you've got about 20% that are currently. Um, working on uh, a new website. And so this comes at a very opportune time. And for that, I'm going to turn to Swati, our, our voice from the little black box there on the um, table. But Swati, if you could tell us, uh, and the reason obviously I asked Swati to go through this with us all is she sees um, RFPs every day, right? And she's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. So she picked out a few of the things that she sees the most or, or want to make sure that we know um, are the best practices to go forward. So, Go ahead, Swati. 
All right, thank you, Susan, and um, thank you, everyone, for allowing me to join you today. I hope I don't seem like uh, the wizard behind the curtain at I and Oz, but uh, I'm assuming everything I'm saying is clear. Susan, if anything, uh, you know, if you're having any audio, I mean, sorry, not uh, yeah, audio problems, just let me know. But yeah, so when Susan uh, came to me and we started talking about this presentation, uh, you know, and as Susan said, look, it really is the Wild West. You can do, frankly, you could do a, you know, quote unquote free WordPress site, you know, but for the opportunity cost for, you know, having someone on your tech group set that up. Um, and then you hear about firms, particularly in the AMWA 100, spending in excess of, you know, $2.5 million for a website, you know, oftentimes even more than that, depending on what they're doing. So um, I'm assuming all of you fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, and we can talk about that later in Q&A, because I, I do think that's something that's sometimes a little difficult to get your head around. But, you know, the analogy, you know, I like to draw is, hey, for a will, I can do a will for free. I could probably find a form online, just do it. Um, most, you know, a lot of, some people do that, I assume. Uh, most fall somewhere uh, past that continuum. So in the same way, and I think the reason I'm mentioning this is because with an RFP, you've got to think this way. And one one thing that we see so often and behind the scenes you can imagine, you know, we have all kinds of folks in marketing saying, hey, I'm shocked no one was fired when we did our last website project. I mean, I'm saying this verbatim. Um, you know, they're saying, look, we ended up going, you know, we ended up spending double what our initial budget was and I'm not even sure why. So those are, you know, those are some of the horror stories. Not everyone has horror stories, but you know, you want to try to avoid those things, right? So how do you do that? Because sometimes they're like, look, we're spending more, and we understand we're not an easy firm to deal with, and we've got 20 people on a committee, and, you know, it's like herding cats, and we're constantly changing our minds. So the first step in that is the RFP. And what you want to do, and this is one of the hardest things to do, is ensure that you have a clear scope and that you're making an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So as an example, um, and this is, again, real life, you know, we had a firm come to us. They'd actually paid in excess of $150,000 to do a rebrand. Okay, so, you know, and so we said, okay, well, what, is, you know, what do you have? So, <laughs> like, what did you get? And they said, well, you know, we thought they were going to, you know, do all the mock-ups for our website, but we got a home page and, a, you know, an inside page, but they were part of mood boards. They weren't really final. <laughs> so we said, okay, like you thought that, you know, so that gives you a sense, right? Like you don't even know exactly what you're getting. You've got to be really, really clear. So ask very pointed questions. I have an example here. You know, which pages of our site will you mock up? Not just we expect you to do the design, right? So when you say, our RFP is for both design and development. But in fact, say that. Some places, literally, they'll do a home page, two pages, and then everything else, they say you don't get mock-ups. Some places will give you a home page design, and even though they say they may give you three, you only get designs two and three if you reject design one. So you really want to be clear in that process. I know it's hard, but I have to tell you, I see it all the time. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors, and this helps avoid that, right? So it helps you ensure that, oh, look, this seems too good to be true. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but if you have the right questions, you'll be able to get to that. Um, transparency, uh, we have had firms come to us and say, hey, I saw this website in your portfolio online. Another company has said that they did this site, and we're like, um, we redid that site five years ago. They built a site for that firm, you know, 15 years ago. So you really want to, again, do your homework. That happens, right? So, um, you know, get URLs. Say these should be sites that were built in the last three years, and, you know, please know that we may contact any of these firms. You've got to, you know, once you start doing that, you find out, oh, this wasn't just a firm that hired this company to come in and talk about business development practices for two hours, and now they're listing them among their web clients. So those types of things happen all the time. I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, designs. You might be like, hey, I'm really interested in Company X because I love, I went to the site, I love the design. Well, A, you know, did they design it? Did they, you know, use a template from WordPress? A lot of times what you're looking at may be something where a company did just the back end and someone else did the design. 
Um, Susan, if you could go to the next slide, um, if you're not there, the one on uh, reliability. So again, um, you know, just know what your costs are going to be in the long term. So again, the RFP is a great way to get, have clarity and predictability for costs. So again, you know, some places will have things, you know, they might call them wellness hours, maintenance hours, you know, um, maintenance plan, you know, Susan can tell you, like, they don't, I mean, <laughs> Susan doesn't spend a whole lot on her site each year, I can tell you that, I won't say how much, but they really don't, and that's what you want, because there are a lot of firms, they get into these quote-unquote plans, they're spending in excess, and this is not for hosting, this is for quote-unquote maintenance, wellness hours, whatever these companies are calling these things, you know, anywhere from $20,000 upwards, and oftentimes the companies that come to us, again, when they're in a new you know, RFP process who've gone through this, they're like, you know, we were spending like 35000 a year and we don't know why we were. You know, a lot of it was for bug fixes and those were counted against our hours. So again, you want to be really careful um, when you're asking questions like that. And, you know, again, just make sure you've got clarity. Finally, um, you know, I started out and I'm not trying to scare folks here, but you know, I'm sure if you talk to your friends in the room, some of the people in the room may even have these types of stories, but but um, you do want to find out, A, you know, you want to get the real story, not just from the company, but also from their clients. So if you have, let's say, a mandate, let's say you have a firm anniversary or something else coming up, just make sure that you are getting enough information that you can sleep well at night. You know, like, yes, I'm working with a company. I've talked to, you know, for all their references. You know, the, A, the vendor told me whether they stayed within the time line or whether they went over um, and so I can confirm that also with the reference and B while it's not really industry practice or you know good form to say how much a firm spent on its website I'm not about to tell you how much Susan spent you know that's for her but you know that's not my place to talk about um, her firm's expenses so I wouldn't be able to tell you that but if you said well what percentage did you go over right so what percentage did you go over when all was said and done you know obviously Obviously, people may have scope additions, things like that. You know, what was for change orders. Places can get percentages. That's not giving away anything confidential. So that way you also have some sense that, look, I'm working with a company that isn't one of the ones that, you know, typically gets into double, triple uh, billing when all is said and done. Um, Susan, that's all I've got right now, and I'll let you keep moving forward. Awesome. Um, and then certainly SWATIGLES will be here. We'll have some time for questions, but I thought we'd move on to um, best practices from your allies, get it? Cheesy <laughs> joke. Um, so when I collected the survey results, I also asked you all for like a best practice that you'd want to share. Um, and I do have those on a slide, and I have some of um, my own too, but just um, I'd love for people just to shout some out too, and then we'll look at what we didn't cover. So somebody give me a best practice. This is for all of the websites. This is for any big website design. Like, what would you say if someone's restarting their website and refreshing? What kind of high quality attorney photos? Oh, that's a great one. That's not even on our list. High quality attorney photos. We were just talking about yeah. that here. <laughs> I, mean, I think now to jump on that, too, that people are using them for LinkedIn, we're using them for other network group websites. They're a little, uh, on our email, they come out as pictures and stuff like that. Right? We're in a society today where everybody has about 
two seconds to pay attention to anything. And again, this is where if somebody uh, hears your name, you have a referral, this is the first place that they go to to check up on you, right? So it's really important, or hears about your firm, um, or you have an ad and they click on it. And that's why this is so important. Um, the visual appeal goes right along with it. Um, you want something that's attractive and, and laid out well, not you know, horrendous to look at and, and scary. Um, concise project team, that's big. Um, somebody said that in this room and I appreciate it and it was something I was going to say anyway. Um, you have to control, um, I think it's boring, but I'm you have to control um, as director of marketing or like marketing committee, what have you, who's ever in charge of this, the process, right? And there's ways to get everybody's input. And, you know, for instance, we did a survey before we started our, our big refresh from the Brady Bunch site a few years ago. Um, and we, we asked everybody's opinions on different functional things. Then we went back later, because we took some of them and some of them we didn't take, right? And then we went back later, oh, thank you for answering that survey. And here's how um, several suggestions that were implemented as a result. And that way people still felt integrated, but your project team, our project team was only a few people. And we were able to do, you know, keep nimble and keep moving and make those decisions, right? Um, so be prepared for not to punch as seamlessly as seamlessly as you envision. That kind of goes to what Swati said too, is um, no matter how, what a great website agency you're working with and um, all the plans that you've laid out, it's a technical product. Things will not always go like you thought. So make sure you do have some bumper um, built in for that, um, to, you know, whether it's part of your contract with your provider that they do fixes for you, um, or whether it's time that you need, resource time to make sure that it's really running well by the time you launch. Um, and I love this one, get the view of a legal industry insider. Somebody um, said that here, uh, or outsider, excuse me, not insider. We have an insider of input, but um, somebody outside of industry, right, that um, we're so used to seeing everybody's sites and we all kind of sometimes say the same thing and we might even look the same. So getting somebody that has a different perspective could add a really fresh element to this. Um, and then keep it updated, and then um, several people said schedule those updates, right? Don't, just don't assume that they're going to happen. Um, schedule them so that they occur, like anything in life. This one was fun. Keep, um, use peer pressure for bio updates. So um, somebody told me that uh, when they have a lawyer that doesn't want to update their bio, um, they ask for um, their top two or three competitors um, in you know, the marketplace. They print their lawyers and go to and sit down with them and say, like, oh, John Doe has all this on, on his bio, and let's look at yours. And then uh, she said it never fails that um, the lawyers are, oh, I do that too. I do that on my bio. And it just kind of, like, gives some ideas and some, some fresh perspective. Um, and the peer pressure always works a little bit. <laughs> um, think about how your content will look in the real world versus, you know, when you're just looking at everything in, like, screenshots originally and trying to um, figure it out. And uh, start content ASAP. This is a great one. Um, because as soon as you know you're thinking about doing a website project, get that content going. Like, right, think about it, you're going to change your voice, or you're going to change um, your your different um, practice descriptions. When we did ours, our switch over, we changed every single page on the whole website. It was thousands of pages of information because it just had never been really looked at in that way. Um, so this was fun. This was also the survey we did in this room. Um, it talks about another best practice is, I hear this all the time in legal marketing circles, how often should we um, redo or refresh our website, right? This tends to be a huge topic. And so in this room, the vast majority of us said every three years. Um, Swati, what do you think about every three years for a refresh or a redo? Um, I would actually say four, you know, it depends. I'm not sure when when people said three years, just from our experience and we have our finger on the pulse in the market, you guys are either much more active in redoing your sites than the majority of the market or people are basing it on the fact that responsive design really came into its own, you know, about three, four years ago. So that doesn't mean they, you know, prior to that they redid it three years prior to that and three years prior. So four to five years um, makes more sense. I mean, if you're kind of going on the you know less expensive route, maybe you're doing it more often. But if you're doing a website the right way 
and given exactly what Susan said, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of strategy. You know, it's not something every three years like, oh my gosh, you know, I need to go through that again. You really want to, you know, it's like when you move into a house. We don't all want to be moving every three years into yet another house. It really should be one that can grow with you. Um, so we did, when, when we did the first iteration after the website I showed you, um, it, three years later, we did a refresh. Um, but it was basically just kind of changing the look of the site. We call it a facelift. So I guess we're in Hollywood now, getting those facelifts every few years. Um, but that project took us, gosh, like one, it's 25th of the time. Your refresh took you a year. Yeah, uh, yeah us too. You too? Okay, ours took us about six months. <laughs> Um, well, you're all law firms, right? So if your site gets hacked, what do you think your clients are going to, you know, and they find out, what do you think any of them are going to say? Even if it's public content, because that's going to be your response. Well, hey, we don't have anything confidential on there. It's all public. Yeah, you know, it's, we're dealing with it. Um, we're like TJ Maxx. You know, you're not going to say we're like TJ Maxx. Instead, you're gonna, <laughs> your attorneys are going to freak out because clients are like, wait a second, you know, you are holding a lot of our confidential data in your systems. What kind of practices are you using? So for law firms, unlike barber shops, you know, the local restaurant on the corner, you've got to be thinking about security from a really serious perspective. And if you're not, you really could be undermining the reputation of your law firm should anything ever happen. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole security lesson here, but, you know, things to think about. Uh, and, again, I'll just take this back to your uh, RFP. You can even ask, you know, because a lot of companies who are out there, you know, they may, you know, get audited by their clients, particularly the bigger the firm is, those firms tend to do yearly security audits. They'll hire an outside company to do that. And that's a great thing to know because if you can't afford it yourselves or don't want to spend the money, hey, we can piggyback off, you know, these others who are doing that. Um, things that are flags that you want to think about. So with a lot of the off-the-shelf systems, that is, again, a big Wild West because things like WordPress, they use open APIs, you know, security practices can really be lacking, right? They use plugins and no one, you know, half those plugins, no one knows who really um, authored them. So they could be from a non-reputable or semi-skilled source. And what that means is that, you know, it's never, the code's never been reviewed or tested for security vulnerabilities. Um, you know, you also want to make sure that there's regular maintenance. So we have a client, I'll give you an example here. So we overhauled their website as the AMLA um, 200 firm and they had a series of blogs that they had had a third party built for them on WordPress. So, you know, for budget and other reasons, they decide to keep those blogs for phase one. And they were saying, yeah, we're supposed to be updating stuff, and no one in tech wants to deal with it at the firm. I'm like, yeah, because they don't want it on their dime, you know, that there is a security issue. So marketing was supposed to be updating, uh, you know, just really bringing the site up to date in terms of security. So they're not coding or anything, but almost think of it as like a Windows update. Um, and so anyway, you can just imagine the morass and the, you know, the number of issues. But if you start asking a lot of colleagues, you will definitely find out there are a number of law firms um, which have either had their main web property or an ancillary property. So when I say ancillary property, I mean like a blogs or you know something else, a mini site um, hacked. And again, that's something you definitely don't want to have happen. So this would obviously be another question in the RFP process when we were talking about that earlier. Um, you can ask your vendors about what they do to um, ensure that your security is top notch. Um, or if you don't know where you stand on that, you could obviously ask your current vendor and then consider an audit, um, like Swati mentioned. I, I think you know people are out there, like she said, even public facing content. People are out there trying to hack everything now, right? Um, and so you have to have integrity as a law firm and security uh, across all platforms. Um, you can imagine if your website got hijacked and um, clients and prospective clients. 
clients went out to see it and some crazy thing had happened to it. Um, it absolutely, I, I can see it easily getting picked up by media, let's just say, like, oh, they have all this confidential and private information, yet they can't even um, secure their own website, right? It could just be a, a nightmare for you. Um, and, you know, you could have to pay ransom you, to get it um, taken off of the, you know, have, um, have them release whatever they're doing to your website. So just really make sure that you're thinking about that. Okay, this topic was okay. And Susan, can I interject one point right yeah. there? All I'll say is if you work with, um, you know, ideally you have, even if it's an IT consultant that your firm may use from time to time, work with IT on that portion and make sure you bring them in the decision making and in the review because there are a lot of red flags that they can immediately say, hey, I have concerns and you want to really listen to those and take them seriously. Um, I think that, you know, more than anything else. So, um, and then secondly, if you have a cybersecurity practice, Practice, you will be thanking us for giving you this point because, <laughs> you know, again, if that ever came out and you say you do cybersecurity, well, that's mud on your face. So go ahead, Susan. Perfect. Um, search engine optimization came up as a real hot topic when I asked you all what you wanted to talk about today. This is a huge area, right? It can be its own, own thing easily. It could be an all-day program easily. Um, so what we did was take, took the best practices that SWATI had, and also um, a friend of mine up here who's a director of marketing at another law firm, she paid a fancy schmancy SEO um, company to come in and do an audit um, for her, and uh, she gave me permission to be able to give you some of these tips. <laughs>
Yeah, sure. So um, when Google, uh, it gets a little technical, but when Google, they have these bots, they index your site. Imagine little pieces of code going through, and they create a massive index of all the websites that are out there. So when they're doing that, so there's no human saying, hey, should Susan's site rank above Mark's site, rank above John's site? Instead, they're looking at, you know, what is on these pages. So among other things, headers are telling them what the page is about. So you really want to make sure that you're using them properly. You know, you don't have like H1 headers all over the place. And if your site is well designed, there should be defaults like when you put in a title or someone's name. You shouldn't be working in a system where you're manually entering a whole bunch of content into one huge field. All the fields should be separated and that way your web developer can help ensure that you have you know, proper hierarchy of headers because that helps those spots properly index your pages. I can talk more about SEO, but I'll let you keep going, Susan, once you'd like me to. I know. We could, I, any one of the things we're talking about, I feel like it could be a, a whole topic. Um, so don't always meditate to meta-descriptions. Um, if anybody's not aware of what those are on the back end of your website, you can enter um, keywords or descriptions. Because the, um, the search engines are able to access that technical content as, it, as it's out there crawling and searching for words. But they also, um, the search engines basically, as soon as you figure something out, they change it, right? Because they know people gain the system. So people started just entering it like a thousand times the same keyword right in the back end of the website. They know that you do that now. So you're, you're encouraged to use them, but just use them sparsely and um, exactly in that way. Use your, your content will speak much louder than your meta tags and your meta descriptions now. Um, and then fix broken links. So uh, most of us, if you have a more modern website, will have like a link sweeper feature on the back end. Uh, make sure to use it. Um, I know a lot of firms have it and, and don't check it, but sometimes links get broken naturally, and that does um, bring you down in search engine rankings if you've got a lot of that kind of content. Uh, if you don't have one, it's really easy. There's so many services out there that provide that, so you can Google it. <laughs> Look for that. Um, and then the increased Google site popularity get others to link to your site without link exchange. Swati, can you mention that or talk about that for a moment? Yeah. Um so Google wants to know which sites are popular, right? They don't want my 16-year-old son's site to rank first if you're Googling, you know, President Donald Trump. They want the New York Times and other relevant places to rank. So how do they do that? They're looking at site popularity. And again, these bots that are creating this index are saying, hey, how many other sites are talking about the site in question? How many are linking to the New York Times versus how many are linking to Swati's son's site? So, it's, you know, you just want to kind of think about things intuitively like that so it doesn't become overwhelming. So when you do link exchange, meaning let's say I call up a place and say, hey, if you link to my site, I'll link to yours. Google is smart enough not to allow that to happen. That's why it's the number one search engine. Instead, and so New York Times isn't doing that. It's not linking out to all kinds of places. So what it does is it enables Google to say, okay, this is relevant. People care about this website. People care about the New York Times. People don't necessarily care about Spotify. Sun site. But what you can do as a law firm, again, for your own site popularity, if there are lots of things that your firm is contributing to, involved with, get them to link to your site. Um, and so a few things to remember. Google results are personalized. I think um, a lot of people might not even realize that. So um, if Allison Googles something right now and I Google the same thing, it, it's smart enough to know a lot about who we are, a scary amount about who we are. Um, and we'll give her something more relevant to her situation and me something more relevant to my situation. Um, so don't assume that if, if you're employing these search engine um, tactics and you look up a key term and your practice or a certain part of your firm doesn't come up in the way you want it to, um, it, it actually doesn't mean a whole lot. It's it's more um, finding, like we, at our firm, we had a professional um, assess that for us. It was our um, agency that we used for PR and advertising. Um, it was, for us, it was really inexpensive. They just went in and um, have ways to search that that's um, more of a quality kind of native search. Um, nothing will be perfect, though, because like I said, even they're, they're kind of in their own controlled environment, too, but they have um, tools on the back end to tell them more. So, so yeah. one of the services that we've actually started using this year at um, Full Transparency, actually is a company that one of our clients bought, um, is they, and this ties into what Jan was talking about, 
to the content is they will, uh, for obviously be, they will talk to your lawyers and in like a 10 minute conversation, they will glean all kinds of facts about a topic. They'll write the article, you proof it, and then they put it out under their, they're called the advocate PR, happens to their call. And for whatever reason, uh, they seem to always get first. Yeah, their SEO is first. Their yeah. SEO, how they've done it. And so if somebody is uh, checking out one of our lawyers, who's we're six people, right? Six, okay. yeah. six lawyers, part of this program, they always come up first. And um, so there are, like, again, for people who have challenges with getting content written, uh, the lawyers have said it's very easy. And they're practicing <coughs> somewhere sometimes a solution to sort of cover off both, uh, both getting content out there and getting it out there first. And, and it looks like they've written, really written these articles and on a topic that selling your business or whatever it happens to be. And it's very little effort by the lawyer. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the byline from your attorneys that no, they write? No, it's, okay. it's, it's written as an article and they're was started by a journalist. I mean, where did yeah, you from, uh, she, uh, uh, she worked for, for the big paper. She also worked for a lot of times. They've just hired the um, fast editor of um, In-House Counsel magazine. They have like a lot of really good legal um, writers on the staff. So awesome. Yeah. Can we ask about how much that costs? Oh. I'm not spitting out any more numbers. <laughs> Swatting. 
you to uh, mention a few trends to look out for. Okay. Trends? Okay. Um, are we good? Oh, cool with that? Okay, hey, Swati, we're going to switch um, over to the trends topic then. Um, we don't okay. have a lot of time, but can you... Would you like me to go ahead? Oh, what's that? Would you like me to just get started on that then? Yeah, yeah, let us know. Yeah, and, you know, it's well, much more than... Yeah. Five minutes or less. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but, um, well, as we all know today, the name of the game is engagement, right? So we have so many things competing for folks' attention, um, particularly when they're on devices. So whether it's social media, email, text, you know, Slack, all kinds of stuff that um, can draw their attention away. So when you think about your website, just keep that principle in mind, engagement. So some of these things that you see here in terms of best practices, enhancing that visitor experience, Experience. So I'm going to just go through really quickly because it's very limited time. Um, you know, you want to think about your brand. Take a look at Susan's site and then look at some of her competitor sites and ask yourself, what's the brand? You know, what does this other firm stand for and what does Smith Anderson stand for? And I think you're going to come away with the answer. But that impacts the visitor experience. They really know who they're dealing with and, you know, what that organization represents. Interactivity, that really enhances the visitor experience again. So, again, we process images about 6,000 times faster than we can process words. So you don't want to overdo images. You know, you're not, sometimes I see law firm sites and they look like they're, you know, a visit state X website. You know, it looks like it's something, you know, to go on vacation. You have pictures of beaches all over the place. Don't do that, please. Um, but, you know, at the same time, intelligently use images, video, audio. You want people to digest information in different ways. Target content. If you know I'm in house, chances are like, look, my you know my love in life is not visiting law firm websites. I'd probably rather be looking at sports scores or my you know how my stocks are doing. But when I go to that law firm site, I'm probably looking either for an attorney or targeted content. Think about blogs and the like. Next, smart searching. You really want to have predictive search. Why is Google pretty much owned the world now? Because it's you know an awesome search engine. Everyone loves to find the information they're looking for. So predictive search. Just base it on Google principles, weighted searches. You know, there are tools you can use if you have a good partner to even say, look, we've got two Jim Smiths here. Um, Jim Smith, the partner, always needs to rank higher when people search on our site. Um, you know, also having like alternative words. People use different words to search. You can't just have an automated index of all that. You'll get odd results, but there are a lot of ways in which you can actually put in those terms that are going to help ensure sure that when someone's looking on your site, the right pages come up. Um, smart excerpts, you know, getting results, you know, getting the context surrounding a search result so you know if it's relevant to you. And then also even seeing terms on the pages when you get your search results. Um, next, uh, you know, we talk about a hub and a spoke. So there, again, and this is going to kind of come full circle, but Susan had talked initially about the fact that some lawyers in particular don't realize how much a website can actually do for you potentially. They just think, oh, you know, it's just kind of saying who we are. It's got my bio and my phone number, and what else does it really need to do? Well, there's so much you can do in terms of automation. So a lot of you are doing print automation, but keep in mind that's only as good as the quality. So a lot of firms, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, we have PDFs on our site, but we can't use them because, you know, we have widowed headers and all kinds of, you know, formatting issues throughout. So, you know, we call those junk PDFs, but, you know, they're there. That's fine. Um, but you want to have things that you actually can use to take those functions off of marketing's plate so marketing folks are able to focus on strategy. Experience database. Susan talked about that at the beginning, and folks aren't really using that. That's a tough one. Very large firms tend to use them, but they also tend to have at least one, you know, full-time staff person managing it because it is. If you have garbage in, you're going to have garbage out. That could be its own presentation. I'm sure someone <laughs> may talk about that but we'll keep moving from there. But again, think how can my website, you know, how can I power all my uh, blogs? You're going to get an SEO boost if you, you know, integrate all your blogs with your website. Also, when I search on the website, then I'm automatically searching all the blogs. I can have granular cross-referencing between the blogs and bios and so on. So those are the types of things. But again, now going back to the things that are going to try to pull people away from the website, social media, right? So, you know, one of the biggest phenomenons of, you know, recent years. 
what you all need to do as marketers, including the lawyers who are marketers, is think, how do we make not just our marketing group and not just the firm or our corporate entity the voice for the firm, but how do we turn all those stakeholders and all the folks within our firm into an army for marketing? So what you want to do, you want to have things like a social share. So we, this is something you know, a few of our clients um, have where you know, they've had us build a feature where, again, I post a press release with a couple clicks. I can have, not only am I going to post it onto the firm's you know, uh, social media properties, but I can have an auto email generated. It's not just a link to the press release, but what it's going to do is when a tur- you know, attorney John Smith clicks on the link for Facebook, it's going to open up his Facebook page and it's going to have all the content in. So literally he clicks twice and he shared it. Nothing more to do, no copying, pasting. So again, make it easy as possible because the more people within your firm who are doing that type of thing, same for LinkedIn and so on, the more visibility that you get. Um, and finally, push marketing. So, you know, let's get information out. You know, we want to make sure that you can't, you know, only be passive. So SEO, hey, that's great, you know, because you do, you may have folks who are interested in a particular topic in particular. So I do like the notion of thought leadership in particular being part of an SEO strategy. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about articles and the like. But again, you know, what are you doing in terms of pushing out to social media, using that army of stakeholders, push out those newsletters, um, again, you know, some even will have third-party sites and articles on them. J.D. Supra you know, in the U.S., uh, a lot of firms have had some success with that. And then finally, bring it all back. Um, if you have a CRM system, try to use that and analytics to see how do things tie together. So I'm going to stop there just because I know we're over. Um, and sorry, that was a drive-by, but I'm trying to cover a lot very quickly. Thanks, Wally. Um, I'm push marketing. I was just going to say quickly, um, I was thinking about your presentation too. Um, we use uh, Clearview Social. Uh, I don't know if people in this room use it as well. Yeah, I would say Allison yeah. did. Real quick, um, talk to me about it at dinner if you want or tomorrow. Um, but it's been an exceptional program. It's relatively inexpensive and it allows your um, lawyers to push out um, all of the firm's social media with one click of a button in an email. Um, and we send ours out weekly and it schedules it for them. Um, and so they have to do nothing other than. We have it set up so Alan can do it without even clicking the button. Oh, 